Hi, sorry, everybody. Welcome to another edition of To The Point Podcast. Everybody's doing well as we get to a weekend after the first big storm here in New Brunswick. Uh, didn't get as much snow as I thought we were going to get, but still a decent storm. But it was a good night to, to shovel, to, uh, get to watch some in, in, intriguing NBA last night. I mentioned uh, the other day that golf is back. Got to watch a lot of that down in uh, the Century Tournament of Champions in uh, Kaluka, uh, Hawaii. So got to watch a lot of that. Some great play, great conditions. Some guys really shooting low. Um, but yeah, I, I, I talked a lot of NFL with Matt Wright yesterday. If you haven't heard, listened to that podcast yet, you can find that wherever you get your podcasts or on our YouTube page or uh, Facebook. So lots of different uh, platforms to to get our content here, but I want to jump on today because there's, there's still a lot to discuss. I mean, every night there's, there's different headlines, there's different stories. I mean, there's the always ongoing drama with Antonio Brown, but that gets a little annoying, uh, quite frankly, and every show's talking about it. So we're, we're not going to talk about that one today because it's just, it's hard not to pick the side of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers when you listen to Antonio Brown and just how, crazy this man sounds does he have an injured ankle probably do you walk out on your team because you have an injured ankle no so we'll move past that one for today but there are some NBA storylines that are really intriguing to me and I thought we'd start today by talking about the Boston Celtics and Boston Celtics are one of the most one of the best franchises in, in sports. If you look over time, the way they've, you know, the way they've won their titles, they're right there with the Lakers, the Montreal Canadians, the, you know, New England Patriots on a smaller scale, but for, for generations, the Boston Celtics were the, were the go-to in basketball. They were the best team, but ever since winning in 2008 and getting back to a final and ultimately losing to Kobe Bryant, Pau Gasol and the Los Angeles Lakers in 2010, the Boston Celtics have been unable to get back to an NBA Finals. They've been to the conference finals three of the last four seasons, but they always seem to be missing something. They pulled off great trades when they parted with, with Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, and Ray Allen, uh, and Ray John Rondo for that matter. But they they got draft picks and they got Jason Tatum and they drafted Jalen Brown. They brought in Kyrie Irving when he left LeBron from Cleveland, but it just never worked. And we look at this season, Brad Stevens in a weird off season move where Danny Ainge was fired, which was well-deserved in my opinion. He moves into Elise from coach where he was at, at Baylor, you know, just one of these coaches that was well, well well-regarded and, he's a a boy genius. And now he's a front office person. He's the GM. He's picking the players. He's buying the groceries, if you will. So that was surprising in the off season. Then they hire Emu Duque, who was a assistant coach at San Antonio, very well liked in that organization, Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, all vouch for him. I have no problem with him getting the job, but they really didn't make that many changes. They brought back Al Horford, who is, let's just say how it is. He's old and he's not that great of a player in this modern NBA with the three point shot. He doesn't rebound that well for a big since Kevin Garnett, the Boston Celtics have been searching for a center. They Robert Williams is, is a good player, but is he going to be able to play against guys like Nikola Vucevic or Julius Randle? Or Clint Capella. I think the proof's in the pudding. He struggles against other bigs. So they're still looking around. And at this point in the season, the Celtics sit at 18 and 21, falling back to back losses at the buzzer to the San Antonio Spurs, who are going to miss the playoffs. And they lose the, the other night to the New York Knicks, who look like they're going to miss the playoffs as well. And to be fair, the Celtics currently sit 11th in the Eastern Conference which is sort of surprising, but sort of not, because I I can see the forest from the trees when it comes to the Celtics. But I I look at Brad Stevens, and I fault him for this. 
and it's easy to say that after I just went through that monologue about what they've gone through, but the last two games, they miss a layup at the buzzer. You're in the NBA. Yes, I'll miss a layup playing street ball by myself, but I stink. You miss a layup to tie and just you lose to the Spurs who had three players in COVID protocol, I might add. Yikes. And then you lose to the Knicks. The Knicks who are looking for anything. They had Julius Randle, their best player of the night, put a thumbs down to the New York Knicks crowd, basically telling them to shut the you-know-what up because they were booing him for the last couple games. Chaos at the Garden. And yet the Celtics still can't get out of that wasteland with a victory. So you got to go back to the, the source. You know, I, we talked about the Edmonton Oilers the other day. They have great players that are actually playing really well. But it's the, it's the depth pieces that hold this team back. I think it's the polar opposite when it comes to Boston. Because in basketball, it's different. One to two players can change the outlook on your team. And there's difference between superstar players and star players. And I think that, that divide has never been larger in the sport. And I think people have a really hard time distinguishing, is this guy a superstar? Is he a star? Is he a good player? And you look at the two best players on the Boston Celtics, and that would be Jason Tatum, who they took third overall. It was the right pick in that draft because Lonzo Ball – and Markel Fultz went above him. So credit to the Celtics for taking Tatum. But just because you take a player third doesn't mean he's going to be a superstar. And Jalen Brown, he's been a great story. He put up 50 points this season. He's a very, very good player. No slouch against him. But are these two guys as a team, as a tandem, good enough to get the Celtics to a championship level play, to get them in title contention well they've been able to get them to a conference title but when you're playing for the Boston Celtics you're not playing for conference championships you're not playing to lose to LeBron you're not playing to get beat by Milwaukee to get steamrolled by Milwaukee I might add you're playing to get to the NBA finals and I I look at these two guys and the way the Celtics play basketball and my correlation is to the 2010 to about 20 14, 2015, Oklahoma City Thunder. Because I think Tatum and Jalen Brown are eerily similar to Russell Westbrook and Kevin Durant. Now, neither of them is a great ball handler like Westbrook, although you could argue Westbrook isn't a great ball handler because he leads the NBA in turnovers this season. But he is a point guard by nature. Neither of these guys is a guy that, in my opinion, you want dribbling up the floor every possession. But... They are the two best players on the team. And what did those Thunder do? And they got to a finals. They got very close. But what they did is one possession, Russell Westbrook's going to get the ball. He's going he's gonna to drive or he's going to shoot. The next possession, Kevin Durant is going to get the ball. And they do the same thing over and over. Eventually, Kendrick Perkins might get the ball. Westbrook gets an assist. But for the 24-second shot clock, 22 seconds of it, one possession, it's in the hands of Westbrook. The next possession, 22 seconds, it's in the hand of Kevin Durant. And eventually, they just said enough. Oklahoma City wasn't winning, but Kevin Durant, who doesn't need the ball that long, who said to himself, I, I, I have a guy that's hogging the ball. He's hurting our chances of winning because this guy isn't efficient. Well, it's not that neither of these guys are efficient, even though I think Tatum shoots way too much. Um, they have no creativity in their offensive possessions. There's no cuts. There's no guys running to the basket. They don't look to Robert Williams often enough in life because the guy's athletic. He runs the floor hard. They just, okay, I'll take the ball. I'll dribble up by the three-point line. I'll pull up and shoot. And then it's same from the next guy. It's almost a competition that they're playing, saying – Oh, you can shoot from three? Well, watch what I can do. You got a long two? Look at me. And it's a stupid way of playing basketball because, yes, you have two, you're two very good players, but you also have four, three other teammates on the floor that could contribute, that can play, that can at least do something. It's not just you guys against everybody else. 
And then to make matters worse, what, what happens? You're dead tired on the defensive end. You have nothing left to give. So Tatum gets torched every night. He used to be a pretty good defender. He isn't anymore. His defensive wind chairs are in the bottom third of the NBA. Jalen Brown, when he came into the NBA, that was his calling card because he was a he was a late round draft pick that didn't have a whole lot of stature. They just thought this guy, this guy might just be a good little contributing player. He's put up a great career. But do I think he should have the cachet? Do I think that he should be, well, I need to shoot. It's a guarantee that I shoot the ball 20 times. No, because unless you're Kevin Durant, unless you're LeBron James, Giannis Antetokounmpo, the elite of the elite, you shouldn't be guaranteed anything. Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum have not earned the right to just say, well, I, I should get this. I need to have this every night. No. And you also have to look in the mirror. You can say you're frustrated with losing and things need to change and our work ethic isn't good enough. But if you don't change the way you play, then you really don't care. It's like a GM that says, you know, we need to make a lot of moves here. You know, I look at, again, I'll correlate back to Edmonton. The bottom of my lineup just isn't good enough. We're not getting enough production. I have too much pressure on my top players. Well, if you're a GM and you bring in the same type talent every offseason that produce nothing, that don't contribute, that are liabilities, then you can only look in the mirror at yourself and say, what am I doing here? And the answer would be nothing to help the team win. So for Tatum and Brown, there's, there's, two, there's two things that can happen. And I think one is more likely to happen. The easy thing to do here is you look in the mirror, you sit down and say, okay, the way we're playing basketball, it's not an efficient style. We're not winning. And our teammates probably hate our guts because we don't even look to pass them the ball. And the way they play, they can't even have a point guard on the floor because they need the ball every damn second. And also, maybe we can run some plays for each other. Maybe you can pick, I'll get the ball. I'll cut down the lane. I give you an open three. There's no, it's no creativity. It's just who can shoot better. It's a, it's a three-point contest from these two guys. It's no wonder the three games under 500. They're too damn good to be 18 and 21. In an Eastern Conference, where you look at it, the Toronto Raptors are ahead of them in the standings. That shouldn't be the case. Cleveland should not be ahead of Boston. Cleveland's been a very good story. They're 22 and 17. Darius Garland's played fantastic. Ricky Rubio was having a great year off the bench till he tore his ACL. Evan Mobley's been a really good draft pick. Kevin Love's had a resurgence. But you look at the two rosters, it's not close. Boston's better. Again, I mentioned Tatum. He had 36 the other night. Robert Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart, who I'm not a huge fan of, but he's an irritant. He's like a Lance Stevenson when Indiana was having really good teams. Dennis Schroeder is a good player. Josh Richardson, great defender. Ennis Cantor can't play a lick of defense, but he can he can uh, he can score at will. He's one of the best scoring bigs off the bench in the NBA. Like. They, they shouldn't be better than you, but they are because they play smarter basketball and they play hard. Charlotte, Charlotte shouldn't be ahead of you. I'm sorry. I love LaMelo Ball. The guy's highlight reel. He's a stud player. PJ Washington plays his heart out, but Kelly Uber, I mean, come on. Mason Plumley, are you kidding me? Terry Rozier, who played for the Celtics, played hard for the Celtics, but no, they had to get rid of him. The Knicks are ahead. Washington's ahead of them. So the easy thing is you, you, you have to sit down and say, we need to change the way we're going to play here or we're fucked. Or there's door number two. And that solution would be, we need to get rid of one of them. And you blow it up. Because to me, it's quite simple. I don't think... Tatum is, good, is a superstar. I've heard it forever that he is. Well, Giannis is a superstar. He won a title. He got to a finals. I think Devin Booker's right, very close to being one. He got to an NBA finals. Tatum hasn't done that yet. 
LeBron, you know it. Kevin Durant, you bet. But every superstar in the league seems to get to a finals, at, you know, at least in their career, and they eventually win one. Tatum, when Boston was a better team than they are right now, even though they should be better, didn't get there. He went through patches where the Chicago Bulls were terrible, where the Miami Heat went through their spell after LeBron left and they had Chris Bosh and, and they got quiet. There's no Ben Simmons in Philly. They have a, they're eight games over 500. I mentioned the Toronto Raptors. The fact that Fred Van Fleet, who is a good player, don't get me wrong. He gets touted a lot. I don't think he's as good as some people say, but he is a good player. Don't get me, he's a good guy. The fact that Fred Van Fleet is more efficient, is a better player than Tatum and Brown this season, that's it. That's an issue. It just is. So do you trade Tatum? Because I think you could get a whole lot of draft picks for him, but it's a tough pill to swallow in Boston to say, okay, we're going to rebuild, and you sell that to your franchise. The Boston, they don't take that well. You look, at, you look at the Patriots, they're in the playoffs. They miss one year, and they had a 9-7 and seven season last year. That's how quick it is. The Boston Bruins have been, a, pro, have been a, a playoff team every year. They're always in contention. They're always in the thick of it. Can the Celtics have a quick turnaround? Maybe. But they went through the Garnett, the, the Paul Pierce shift from old to let's bring in some new faces but they never won. And winning in sports is not easy. Don't get me wrong. It isn't. But it, there's, it's a different level of pressure. It's a, different, it's a different feel in certain cities. And I give more credence to the pressure, to the expectations, to actual title cities. Boston is one of those. I hear about pressure in Toronto, in Dallas, with the teams like the Cowboys, I give less thought to that because what's the pressure? You haven't won anything. I think there's more pressure in sports when you get drafted, when you go to a team that is actually that is actually good, for lack of a better word right now, that has had success. You get drafted to Toronto. If you do win, which you're not expected to if, for fans because you expect failure, you're a godsend. You're a hero. Imagine if Evan Mobley brought a title to the Cavs sans LeBron. He would be a living legend. But you're juxtapose it. You're LeBron James. You go to LA. You're going to the house that Kobe built. You're going to the house that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar built. You're going to the Jerry West Memorial Coliseum. You need to win. Because what did the best players before you do? They won. It's a much tougher thing to do. If you go to the San Francisco 49ers as a quarterback, why do you think Jimmy Garoppolo gets killed as much as he does? Because Steve Young, because Joe Montana won Super Bowls. Plural. What did Brett Favre do? He won. What, what did the, the great quarterbacks in Pittsburgh do? What did TB do? Terry Bradshaw. He won Super Bowls. Ben won too. That's, that's pressure. It's, it's much greater to play loose. And I look at a team like the Chicago Bulls, the, the Jordan mystique, that's worn off because they haven't won a title since 98. That's 20 plus years. But that, they, they didn't have that aura before them. Teams like the Packers, teams like the Steelers, the Lakers, the Montreal Canadiens, they had sustained success for decades and decades. The Bulls were only successful with one guy, Michael Jordan. Before him, they weren't winning. They weren't getting NBA finals. They weren't title town. Edmonton is known as the city of champions. Well, before Mess and before Gretzky, were they winning? No. So they weren't, they're the city of champions because they were champions. That does not mean a guaranteed level of success for Connor McDavid. 
I just think it's vastly, vastly different when you are playing for a team that has had generations of success compared to media driven pressure. Because who gives a crap about the media? I guess there's le- there are people like me in the world that really don't care what people think about them. And it's a blessing and a curse. I think it, there's positives and negatives to that, to my POV. But if you are a, I was going to say Aaron Rodgers, but I think he cares too much. If you are a Tom Brady, let's say, I'm not comparing myself to Tom Brady, but I do think we have, we have a similar point of view on this. Then the media is nothing. If you're, if you're a Bill Belichick, you don't care what people think about you. You just go about your day. But if you, if you go into sports, what, what do you, everybody wants to do? Whether you're playing mini sticks, which can get ultra competitive, I'm not add. Whether you're playing a round of golf with friends. Whether you're playing cornhole, you want to win. It gets competitive whether you want it to or not. That's, that's the nature of any kind of sporting, of any kind of competition. And I think you, you come in and you say, I want to win, of course. But then, oh, my God, I just got drafted to the, the Boston Celtics or the Los Angeles Lakers. Look at Lonzo Ball. Irvin Magic Johnson said one day his number will be in the rafters. You don't think that's pressure? Because guess whose name is in the rafters? Irvin Magic Johnson. He's one of the all-time greatest players. Lonzo saying, He thinks I can be with him up there. I could be a guard with my number up there with magic. And you're not, your number's not just going up there because you had a good career, because you're a good guy and you you average a double double. It's because you won, plural. You won championships, not chip. You won championships. But the Celtics, This team, these players have to make a decision. Do we play together and figure out a way to get better? Maybe we make a few additions. Maybe we find a big Robert Williams would be better off the bench. We get some shooters. I like Josh Richardson, but I like Seth Curry more. That was a trade, ultimately. Um back in the the, uh, Dallas for for Philly, but do we find some outside shooting that that can help improve our team? Could we get a really good bench player that could be a six-man for this team? Atlanta Hawks are falling out of it. They lose to the Lakers last night. Would Lou Williams come to Boston? A little older, but he still plays pretty tough. He's still a really good bench player. He's done it in the playoffs, did it for Atlanta last year, caught fire. Could we do that? So we'll see, but I I look at the Celtics and they need to figure it out quick because the NBA season keeps moving. Teams get better. The teams go through spurts. I I look at it right now and look at the standings in the East. I believe the Bulls are going to be a very good team all year. I I just, I like their makeup. I, you know, DeMar is playing an MVP level. Vucevic, they got last year. Lonzo Ball has really gotten better. Caruso is a great signing. This team, I think, is set up very, very well. They won nine in a row to make the playoffs and be one of the top three seeds. I don't worry about them. Brooklyn, they're going to be there. We're going to talk about them in a second here. Really interesting conversation I heard yesterday. Uh, but Brooklyn will be in the in the top four for sure. Milwaukee, defending champions, you bet. I mean, Giannis plays great. They got Bobby Portis off the bench. Holiday didn't even play last night. But this team... This team's a good team. They'll be there. Miami, I, I feel the same way. They got Kyle Lowry in the offseason. They have Jimmy Butler. Um, you know, they're, they're playing a lot of reserves right now because of COVID, but Tyler Hero, Duncan Robinson, I, I like this team. Bam on a bayou. They'll, they'll be okay. They're Philly making the playoffs. I believe Cleveland will make the playoffs. They, they won't have as easy road as some other teams because they're younger. I think they'll go through their spurts but I do think they'll make the playoffs. Toronto, Toronto's, they're, they're right there with, with Boston. They're a bubble team for me. Charlotte, Washington, New York, Atlanta, all these teams are the same. They all could make the playoffs. They all could not. But 
if you're Boston and you creep into the seventh spot and then you play Chicago or Brooklyn, you get bounced. That's not, that's not your season. You're better off missing the playoffs, getting a lottery pick and hoping that you can improve the team. You can drop the, the great kid out of Duke um, who, who looks like a stud, but hopefully if you could, if you could get a lottery pick. So they need to figure it out because the East is, is tougher than it has been in prior years. And I look at the West. I, I think Phoenix is, is obviously very good. Golden State, Utah, I trust. I think they'll be the top three. Memphis has been really good all year. They're making the playoffs. I, I can't see them dipping that far. I just think they're, they're better than they're better than Dallas for sure. I think the Lakers will continue to improve. They won four in a row. Denver should get better. But after that, there's, I mean, San Antonio, Minnesota, the Clippers, you'll see these teams make the playoffs. You won't see any of those teams make the playoffs. So there's less wiggle room with the bottom seeds than there is uh, in the Western Conference for a team like the Celtics. Now, I mentioned the Brooklyn Nets, and they've been interesting all year because Kyrie Irving has not been playing. Kyrie Irving sat out at the beginning of the season because he chose not to get vaccinated. And the team said, we are only going to accept full-time players. And as it stands still, he is not able to play home games because there is a vaccination mandate in New York, which of course would include Brooklyn. So, you know, they've held that stance all year. You know, Kyrie is not, he's not playing for us and they start the year and they've had their ups and downs and they've gone through COVID and this and that, but what's happened the whole year? Well, they've won games. Sure. I mean, they're, they got Kevin Durant, the best player on the, on the planet. They got James Harden, who quite frankly, hasn't been that good, but what have these guys had to do? They've had to log huge minutes. Kevin Durant is averaging almost 40 minutes a game and he's 32. Yes, he's not ancient, but that's too many minutes. Harden is averaging 37 minutes. And their two superstars have been forced to carry such a load that you're starting to see them wear out a little bit. You're starting to see them get very tired. So now it's, well, how are they doing? You know, what, what's happened? What, what's going on with Brooklyn? And that, that's, that's really, they, they, they needed help. So right before Christmas, it's announced that Kyrie Irving is going to return to the Brooklyn Nets. And of course, he's still a part-time player. So they're going against what they initially said. They're backing out on their, on their initial stance. And yep, you can call them hypocrites, which it, it was a hypocritical act to go against what you said, what, what your true hardcore values were. But again, what is, our, what is the concept here? It's like Ted, DiBi Ted, Di uh, Ted DiBiase, sorry. It comes down two dollars and cents. It's about the money, and so Kyrie comes back Wednesday night, plays a very good game. They looked rejuvenated. They looked. Kevin Durant looked happy for the first time in a very long time. Have his buddy playing with him, and for his first game back, Kyrie played pretty well for not playing a game. He had twenty-two points. He you know, only had four assists, three rounds, but he had three steals. Played thirty-two minutes. But, you know, Kevin Durant still played 41 minutes. They played last night at home, so Kyrie couldn't play. Kevin Durant, they get blown out against the Bucs. But Kevin Durant still played 37 minutes. Harden played 36 in a game where they lose by 12, but it, the game, they checked out the game, them losing by 20. So it's... It, it's a struggle, and I, I look at Brooklyn, and this is the really the, the interesting topic today. Nick Wright, who works for Fox Sports 1, um, he, he uh, is on a show called First Things First, and he was on the Dan Patrick show this week, and he is an interesting guy. I, he's a bit of a – I don't always love Nick's takes because he's such a LeBron. He, he likes to kiss LeBron's ass a little much for my liking. Maybe he's looking to become a, a clutch sports client to get some of that cash. And he's also, you know, Kansas City Chiefs. He loves them. So he kind of, he's, he's very much a media guy that I'll, I will give him this. He's open about his fandom. So I will give him that. I think there's some media people that are, 
that hide it, and that bothers me. But he did bring up this idea. He was very much against Kyrie Irving returning because he he thought, number one, it's tough to develop chemistry when a guy only plays road games. 100% true. That's spot on for Nick Wright. He also added that, well, him coming back and winning hurts this team because if the vaccine mandate holds up and the Nets have a really good record, those start every series at home, meaning in the playoffs games, one and two of every series will be played at Barclays Center. And Kyrie, to, as of right now, will not be eligible to play in those games. Now, there is a new mayor. That could be scheduled subject to change, but I'm just going based on what we know now. And I think this, you know, he kind of said, you might want to tank some of these games. You might want to lose some of these games so that, you know, for lack of a term, you start series on the road so that in games five and game seven, you are guaranteed to play on the road where Kyrie Irving would be eligible to play. And I got to say that to Nick Wright's point, I think this is spot on. I think, I think, I think he's completely right because the Nets are not going to beat. I know for sure the Milwaukee Bucks without having Kyrie Irving. I don't think they can beat. I, I find it hard to believe that they can beat the Milwaukee Bucks with, uh, with Kyrie Irving only for the seven games. And that's if, you know, that's if Brooklyn finishes higher in the standings, which they are right now. They're in this, they're the second seed. If the playoffs are today, Milwaukee is the third seed. I think they need Kyrie for more of these games. Maybe the mayor will help out Kyrie. And ultimately, after sitting out, being able to come back from his team, he will get the full tour around the sun, get exactly what he wants. And a guy who you know, decided to sit out on his team will ultimately get the biggest come up. will get everything he ultimately wanted in the end and get to sit out the first half of the season, which really doesn't mean a whole lot in the grand scheme of things. But if it stays the same, they they need him and if if it is about giving yourself the best chance to win they should try to lose some of these games they should tank for the playoffs now and they didn't tank last night against milwaukee because what you need to do is when you tank games kevin durant can't play 37 minutes i'm not saying you you sit him out because the nba will, will figure that out and they'll penalize you for it but he's 33 he's played 14 years in the league he can't play that many minutes. 37, like I said, he's averaging a ton of minutes. 38 a game. Harden, 37. Patty Mills, really good player. But you can't have these guys play this excessive amount of minutes and hope to win. You need Kyrie. LaMarcus Aldridge has been a godsend for them. Cam Thomas is a walking bucket. He's a 20-year-old off the bench. He's in his for he's a rookie. He's a, he's a great player, but he's, he's just a score. That's what he's going to do. But I, I like him a lot, but you need, if Kyrie's not going to play, you need to have, you need to have him. You need to put yourself in the best position four out of seven. And you also need James Harden to play better. I, I look at his games lately, especially last night watching against Milwaukee. He's just a non-factor. He either he takes bad fouls or he turns the ball over because he doesn't play any defense. So you know that's going to be a problem. And especially it's a problem when Kevin Durant gets in foul trouble. He had three fouls before halftime. And let's just face it, the Milwaukee bench is better than Brooklyn. And Milwaukee didn't have half of their bench last night. You look, Giannis Middleton played well. You had Bobby Portis, who's usually off the bench. He had 25, 20 by halftime. But Rodney Hood had 10. He caught fire. Uh, Giannis' brother, Giannis, played. But they didn't have Grayson Allen last night. They didn't have Patrick Connaughton, who's a regular. They didn't have DiVincenzo. They didn't have George Hill. They didn't have Drew Holiday, who's a regular starter. And they didn't have Brooke Lopez. They're starting center. They're starting uh, shooting uh, small guard. And three players off the – four players that are normally off their bench did not play last night. And they get destroyed. I get, and that just tells you about Brooklyn. They don't have a good bench. And honestly, other than Patty Mills, they don't have a consistent, 
They don't have consistent players. Cam Thomas is good, but James Johnson, he's not – Bruce Brown, Bembry, Carter, they don't have guys that are going to step up in big games. Where I look at Milwaukee, Pat Connaughton had games in the playoffs last year where he had big buckets. George Hill will come out of nowhere and put up a 20-point, six, seven assist game. That's just what he does. Grayson Allen has a three-point shot. Milwaukee builds a team. That, that's, a, that's why they won. Yes, Giannis was fantastic, but they also had players around him that could play well. Chris Middleton is a really inconsistent. He's a guy that plays great one game and then is a no-show the next. But they have guys that can step up in, in the big moments and play when they need them to. You know, uh, Milwaukee just parted with, with DeMarcus Cousins, who was playing really well for them, but they needed the roster space, so they cut him. To me, he was playing good ball. If I'm Brooklyn, I take a look at him. That's just me, but he was playing good basketball, Boogie Cousins. And he, the other, he, his last game with Milwaukee was on, um, was on Wednesday against the Raptors. He played 20 minutes. He had 15 and 10, and they cut him because they, and they needed the roster space. And he's 31. He's gone through a ton of injuries. He's not what he used to be. But you see, in his in his limited games, he had, in his last five games, he had six. He had played 16 minutes, nine points, five boards. 16 minutes, 15 points, five boards. Nine points, two boards. 15, 10, three steals, a block. He's not going to play great defense, but he's going to average close to 10 a game in 16 minutes. That's efficient basketball. I, if I'm Brooklyn, I take a look at Boogie Cousins because they still don't have length. They don't have a they don't have a great player. Nick Claxton, I like him. He plays extremely hard, but he's not an X factor. He's a guy with great leaping ability, but he's not he's not a game breaker by any means. And I wouldn't say he should be your starting center. Lamarcus Aldridge, if he's playing center, you're in trouble. He's 36. He's played 16 years in the in the league. And he's just not a great rebounder anymore. You know, he's not that kind of guy that's gonna that's gonna uh, attack you at the rim. He's a power forward. That's that's his role. And so they still have their weaknesses. But getting back to Nick Wright's point, I think they should look into it. And I think they should explore. Like, hey, tonight we should lose because unless they hear news from the from the new mayor or from government officials that in New York, you're going to be allowed to play sports without a vaccination, which I find hard to believe after all that we've been through the past two years, you see what's happened. I've been talking about this week, what's happened with Novak Djokovic in Australia to go through all of this, through all the restrictions, through shutdowns, stores, you name it. And then say, well, pandemic's over now. You can just come play even if you don't. Well, that kind of punches people in the face who got a vaccination. Because what's the point of getting one? If, if you're saying you're going to get these different rights, if you're going to get more freedoms, then the people that shouldn't, that didn't get it, by this just by government. I'm not saying this is my opinion. I'm just saying, why? And this is just a common sense thing. Why would they say, go get this? And then when it's over, quote unquote, they'll say, okay, well, you didn't, you didn't listen to us, but come on in, you know, oh, come on, you didn't pay rent. I'll stay an extra month. Come on in. We love you. Oh, you're at 7-Eleven? Oh, you don't have money for the Slurpee? Oh, it's take two. Yeah, no, that's so good. You had a good smile. Oh, hey, Homer. Oh, you're stealing the donuts back there? Oh, that's okay. Take another 12 for Marge. Like, no, that's not how life works. At least it shouldn't. If you tell your kid, don't go punch somebody, and he goes and suckers them, you're like, oh, good job, Sonny. We're going to get ice cream. Well, if you're a bad parent, maybe that's the way you run your life. But I, <laughs> I don't see that happening because it would really slap the common sense. It would really slap the... We're all in this together, you know, one for, one for all, all for one, whatever kind of militaristic uh, ideal you want to put on this, that would really kind of shun it. And it would really kind of make not, 
not make a whole lot of sense in the big picture thinking here. But maybe that's what they'll decide to do. Maybe Kyrie will just be, they'll be like, hey, come on in, Kyrie. We missed you down here. Your past still works at Barclays. And the New York mayor will be like, hey, I really want to win an NBA title. Maybe stranger things have happened, but not everybody's a sports fan. And even sports fans, there's more Nick fans than Nets fans in, in New York, even in Brooklyn. <laughs> I think Spike Lee lives in Brooklyn. He, uh, he doesn't give a shit about the Nets. So it's going to be interesting the rest of the season. And, you know, there's even some places on the road he can't play. Like, I, I believe in Philly, he can't play right now. He can't play in the Bay Area. So he's going to be playing some games and then some games he won't. So it's going to be hard to track when is Kyrie in the lineup. Like, if we look ahead here to Brooklyn, next upcoming schedule, they lost last night. They played tomorrow at home. Can't play. I know that one for sure. He cannot play uh, as of now. Portland, I think he can play that game. So he can play in Portland, I think. Again, again, I think Chicago, I don't know because I don't, again, that's a tough one. I do not know that one home can't play again. I know that one. So you're just like, this is how it's going to go all year now. Can he play? Can he play? Can he play? And how are you going to build chemistry with that? He's one of your, he's your second best player and he can only play one of every five games. So you're plugging in another another guard every other game. Hey, you want to dress tonight? Can't play tomorrow, but you can play tonight. It's crazy, but it's fun. I don't know. Pro sports in 2022. You can play here, but you can't play here. <laughs> I don't think you can play in a pickup court in Brooklyn. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, but we'll see what happens with the Nets going forward because um, they're just a walking, you know, they're a walking gong show, but boy, it's a fun one to track. And uh, yeah, that should be fun down the stretch here. And also in the NBA, there's still a lot to that I think could happen. I mean, Ben Simmons is still a member of the Philadelphia 76ers. Haven't heard about him in forever, but he's still on the roster. Daryl Morey said, I'm not going to trade him. He's stuck to that. They still want to get a good haul for him. And you look at 76ers, they sit fifth in the Eastern Conference at 22 and 16. They've had a pretty decent season. Embiid, 27 points, 10.7 rebounds a game, one and a half blocks. They still have Tobias Harris. They still have Seth Curry. Um, you know, Thibel is a really good defender, Tobias Harris. I don't think they're good enough to win a title, but they clearly think that they can, they can go far. Then you have a team like the Portland Trailblazers who have had a disastrous season. They are 12th in the Western Conference. They're behind Sacramento at 14 and 24. They just lost to Cleveland the other night. And Damian Lillard is having one of the worst, is having the worst season of his career. He looks completely out to lunch, shooting only 40% from the field, which is terrible. 24 points, seven rebounds, only four, uh, seven assists, four rebounds. It, it hasn't been good for Dane. And CJ McCollum is still there. He's averaging 20 points. It's going down for him. He's so... What's going to, you know, you look at the, this is, I'll tell you what, what Dame, how good Dame's been in this league. 2018, 25.8 points a game. 2019, 20, 30 points a game with eight assists. 2020, 2021, 28.8 points per game, 7.5 assists, shooting 45% from the field, 46.3% and 44.4% the year before. This year, 29 games, 24 points a game. 4.1 rebounds, 7.3 assists with 40% shooting. That's five points down from field goal percentage from last year, and that's over four points a game dropped from last season in his pod totals, almost five. 
bad, bad year. He came back saying he was upset with losing. You're, you're with a new coach in your first year. You're 10 games under 500, bro. I think Portland, Portland, could they make a comeback and make the playoff? I, I look at the West and I do think, like I guess I think this year they have a better chance of doing it. Um, but it's not going to be easy. They're going to need to start going on a run. They're going to need to find a connection, find some consistency because they haven't had it all year. They play Sacramento tomorrow. That's a good place to start because they stink. So if, if you, it could be, if you lose to Sacramento tomorrow, that could just signal it's over here and you trade both guys and maybe it's a Ben Simmons, Dame Lillard, Damian Lillard and Joel Embiid in Philly as a tandem would be a lot of fun. I would sign up for that. I, I would love to see those two link up and play together. Will it happen? We'll have to wait to see, but definitely could happen for sure. And uh, CJ, I don't think he's, I don't think a lot of teams would give up a lot for him, but in his past, he's been a good shooter. Damian Lillard, when he's healthy, when he's on his game, he's a superstar. He's one of the best players in the world. He's just been on a team that hasn't had enough around him, in my opinion, because he's made clutch shots. He's played in big games. He's hit a series winner, a walk-off shot. I don't look at Dame Lord as the key. I don't look at him as a Jason Tatum. He is a team guy, but he hasn't had the play. Nurkic has been a Band-Aid. T.J. McCollum has been really inconsistent. But Marcus Aldridge back in the day wasn't good enough. So I think it's time for him to move on. He doesn't want to go to a big market and chase a ring, and I have the ultimate respect for that because I look at Milwaukee at – Giannis's NBA title in Milwaukee last year, I think it has more weight. I think it has more, it'll age a lot better than any of LeBron's titles. I think it'll age better than definitely Kevin Durant's. Giannis and Dirk Nowitzki have two of the most pure titles in the past 30 years in the NBA because they, they were drafted by that team they stayed there they didn't need to recruit a bunch of superstars to come join them gms added players through trades drew holiday came they made additions jason kidd went to dallas at the tail end of his career sean marion was a six man but these guys two europeans oddly enough stuck where they were at found a way for it to work and ultimately won a title and they were the two superstars that led them there they had help but they did it. And Dame, I think, is we're starting to see he got to a conference final. He had his chance the year that Kevin Durant was out of that Western Conference final series. And that's the year ultimately the Raptors won the title when Kevin Durant came back in game five and he blew out his Achilles. But they had their opportunity that year. They lost in six. You had your look to get to an NBA Finals. You go up against the Raptors, maybe you lose. But at least you say you got to an NBA Finals. I think looking at this season, I'd be surprised if he was a Portland Trailblazer by the end of the trade deadline because they're not going to make the playoffs. They're not a good team. Even if you do make the playoffs, if you draw Phoenix, if you draw Golden State with a healthy clay, who's likely to return tomorrow night against the Cavs, if you if you draw one of those two teams, who are, if they're not the one, two seeds, I think you know, something's happened or you're going to play Utah you're not beating them either. So it's no gift. If you get to the, if you get to the play in, you're going to lose the series that you play. So it's time for, for, a, for a shift in Brook and Portland. And I think we'll see that um, in the not too distant future. Um, some breaking news here on the, on the podcast is just, was just reported out that um, the Carolina Panthers have sent out that they're planning to keep head coach Matt rule for another season um and they uh he's been their head coach for two seasons now um he's not exactly been a great coach they brought him in to really show people you know like hey i'm a college coach i had a great program at baylor i turned around there and they thought hey you're a college coach you can do it here in carolina and david uh, david tepper brought him in but it hasn't exactly gone that way. It hasn't been a great success story for Matt Rule yet. Because you look, first year, 
they got rid of Cam. That was okay. They went through some growing pains. They had to get better. But he then he brought in Sam Darnold from the New York Jets. And I actually thought that would work because I think Sam was better and he had that Jets stench on him. But this year, it hasn't gone great. They're going to miss the playoffs again. They've been a disaster. They don't have they have Sam Darnold under contract for next year, but they don't have a quarterback of the future. And in two seasons, Matt Rule's gone 10 and 22. Um, so where where do they go from here really is is the story. And it's a, it's it's like a goalie. You need to find a quarterback. You need to if you do not have a quarterback, you don't have a chance. And Matt Rule needs to find one because it's easier in college because you don't need to have an elite player at court. He needs to be good, but he doesn't need to be elite for you to win the Big 12, for you to be in that conversation, to be a good coach. But he hasn't yet. The team is, has good defensive players like Brian Burns, like these type of guys, but it, there needs to be a more consistent play there. And I, I'm, I think it is the right decision in a sense. You know, I think we'll, I guess me and Ryder talked about yesterday. I don't think there'll be many coach firings. One I thought about overnight that I forgot to, to touch on was the Denver Broncos. I think Vic Fangio will be let go. I think obviously Matt Nagy will be fired. I expect Mike Zimmer to be fired by the Minnesota Vikings. So that's three open, open uh, vacancies there. The Giants said Joe Judge is not going to be let go. Matt Rule said, you know, if that's true, Jeremy Fowler reporting of the mothership that he won't be let go. So there still could be a few jobs that I'm forgetting, but looking at the teams, you know, Steelers likely going to miss the playoffs. Mike Tomlin's not going anywhere. John Harbaugh's not going to be fired. Zach Taylor's making the playoffs. Browns, I don't believe so. Again, that's the one that's a sneaky one. Houston, they're going to stink again. David Culley, I think, oddly had a good year, even though they're four and 12. So I don't think they fire him. Jacksonville already fired Urban Meyer. Washington, I don't think they'll fire Ron Rivera. He is a warrior. I think they want to give him another crack. They made the playoffs last year. Falcons, no, they just had a first-year coach. They'll keep him. Jets, no. I mentioned the Bills. I think it's a long shot, Sean McDermott. But if they lose in the first round of the playoffs to the Patriots, that would be a tough look for that for that team that said they're taking the next step. They're the kings of the AFC East. I think that and it would be tough. That would be a tough pill to swallow. Another one, I also forgot this team, Seattle. You know, what is Seattle? Seattle 6-10. and 10. Do they fire Pete Carroll? Does Russell Wilson leave? There's a lot of, there's a lot of, I don't know there. So I think there's potentially four with Seattle. They're very intriguing. I just thought Russ would be gone for sure. But he said in the last couple of days, he wants to win in Seattle. So maybe ownership has told him, hey, Pete's going to, we're going to let Pete go or Pete is going to, wants to leave and he can, you know, I, I, if I'm Pete, if, if I'm a team, Pete Carroll should get a, could, should get a look because he got the two Super Bowls in Seattle. He won one. Yes, he's an older guy, but he is a college coach that was a big success. And I would choose a quarterback over a head coach any day of the week. And maybe their philosophies are different, but he could get another job, I'm assuming, relatively quickly. But we'll see. Last day of the NFL season, of the NFL regular season, is tomorrow. And then usually Monday, we'll see some firing. So that's a lot of content that should be coming away in the near future. Um, PGA Tournament of Champions. Always a fun, it's fun to start off the year in Hawaii. And like I said, but the last, you know, last night it was on, it's in prime time. I love it. Getting, to, you know, just watching it, it ends at 11 o'clock. And that's just, I wish every tournament was like this. But you start the day, Cam Smith's in the lead. He goes bogey, bogey to start the day. And I'm like, oh, he's, and you see guys like John Rom and Daniel Burr, aka my guy Hamburger, start to pick it up. Patrick Cantlay in a group with John Rom, which is just fantastic. You got, Hideki Matsuyama partnered with Brooks Kepka, But after those two bogeys, Cam Smith shoots nine under for the rest of the day. His, he didn't miss a green, neither did John Rahm. They didn't miss a green the entire day. But his short game, and just to make it really obvious here, Cam Smith's putter was hotter than Halle Berry yesterday. 
I mean, he was money. He was making, he made some long eight to 10 foot putts. He got close to the hole. I mean, his, it's perfect conditions down there in Hawaii. And guys were shooting extremely low. I mean, you look, Cam Smith, nine under yesterday. Hamburger, seven under. John Rahm, seven under. Cantlay, six. Sanjay M, six. Hideki Matsuyama, eight under. Kepka, eight. Seamus Power, eight. Sam, uh, Samwise Burns, minus nine. So everybody was having low scoring days. But with only 39 people in the field and it being the first term of the year and guys haven't played since October. And even John Rahm talked about this yesterday. He said it so confidently, but I liked it. He said, you know, I don't, I don't feel any rust. Like I, I just feel, you know, I can just step out here and play well. And that is exactly it. I mean, Cantley has not played and Cantley won PGA tour player of the year last year, even though I think it should have went to John Rahm. He, he hasn't played since he won the, the FedEx cup. And he's like, no, I feel good. Like, I don't think I, I I've played a fantastic round six under he did, but you look at Cam Smith to go eight under Thursday, then nine under Friday, the guy is just feeling it. And he's another up and coming star because he's finished top five in, in two of the four majors last year. And there's the usual names of Rom Kepka, um, Xander Shoffley has always been there. Obviously, Bryson takes up a lot of airtime. Uh, Victor Hovland is a fantastic player. Justin Thomas has always discussed speed. But he is right there with, with the top players in the world, Cam Smith. He can do it. And But what is great is I think it's going to be a great weekend of golf for the first weekend because he has a three-shot lead coming into today, but he'll likely be partnered. He finished around with Daniel Berger yesterday, so they played together Thursday Friday. I'll be interested to see if, if they are part. I don't believe they've announced the pairings yet today. So we'll see what um, what happens with, with the pairings because it's only tonight. But you have him at 17, Berger and Rom at 14 under, Cantlay at 13, Sung J M and Matsuyama at 12 under, Kevin Na at 11 under, Kepka, Leishman, Burns, Stewart Sink, Siwoo, Shoffley all at 10. So guys are, are close. And with the conditions such, such so favorable for, for scoring, seven strokes isn't going to be, you know, unless Smith just continues to, to pile it on, guys can come back and guys can get back into contention here. And, you know, Cam Smith having his two great days, Thursday, Friday, it's unlikely he'll be as good as he was the first two days this whole weekend. So I think it will give an opportunity for guys to get back in this tournament make it more competitive. And I, for a first term of the year, I think this one's going to be a great, great finish, but it's just so great to see golf back. I, yeah, I, I can't, believe it took me this long to get into it to be quite honest, but I, I so thoroughly enjoy watching it. Some of the guys are, are unbelievably talented and like I said, you're not playing that often, but you get out there. I mean, they're playing this weekend tournament of champions and they go to the Sony open which is also in Hawaii. And then, like I said, you start going the, the farmers, which is at Torrey Pines. That'll be at the end of January. That's a tournament that's always full. The Pebble Beach Pro-Am is, is a very uh, popular tournament. Then you got the uh, Phoenix Open at the waste, at the TBC Scottsdale, which is one of the nicest courses in the world. So we'll see what happens, but a really tight, really tight tournament thus far. It should come down to the wire this weekend with the likes of um, Cam Smith, John Ron, Patrick Cantley, the only 39 guys in the field, and they're all some of the beat, some of the best players in the world. So it should make some, some for some great drama this weekend. Also, you know, there's some really great stories. I'm not going to touch on a whole lot today just because you know, a lot of the, I'm already into an hour here in the NBA. It just took up a lot of the thoughts because I, I just had to get through a lot of it, but Pittsburgh Penguins have won 10 in a row. I'll try to get to them next week as they've been playing fantastic. I watched the Vegas, New York game. I, I taped it, watched it yesterday during the storm. Vegas is really starting to impress me. They, they still don't got a great number one center, but I like what they've done with their depth. And I think it can change their fortunes come the playoffs. Um, great story. Matthew Boldy gets called up by Minnesota. He scores his first NHL goal. Um, Kaprizov is out for Minnesota. I didn't like that hit from Trent Frederick. I thought it was pretty gutless, if you ask me. 
he's a guy that um, you know he only seems to he only seems to hit guys that are, are skilled from behind. I, I really I'm not a big fan of him. Um, game cancellations. I get why they're doing it, but I can get why guys like Bruce Boudreaux and the Ottawa centers are being pissed because Ottawa has played one game in the last 23 days. And I, to me, this is just a failure of our government. Let people in the rank, let people go watch games. Look, again, I'm not going to win this argument with the, oh, we need to be safe crowd, but the show must go on and I get about making money, but I don't see a reason why you can't allow people to go watch the game to pay for tickets. I was just in Edmonton. You couldn't buy a, a drink out there. You couldn't buy a, a Coke. You couldn't buy a, a fry. Well, maybe you can't go to concessions, but can you buy a ticket and go sit half capacity, something it's better than nothing. And I, I just think you can't keep canceling games because teams aren't going to be playing forever. You see, again, Ottawa, there's no game tonight. You don't think Sportsnet's freaking out tonight because, yeah, they got their precious Leafs against the Avalanche, which should be a great game, by the way. I'm not downplaying that game, but there's no late game. No, oil, no Islanders Oilers tonight. No Sens Canucks. No Kraken Jets. No Sabres. That, those are all Hockey Night in Canada games. No dice. And I doubt they're going to put Blackhawks, Gold Knights, or Rangers, Ducks, or Red Wings, Kings to fill, fill up that second slot. So they're missing a game there. I don't know what they're going to do, but it creates problems. That's all what I'm saying. And it, you, the NHL, and this is not an NHL in my opinion, this is on our governments, on our provinces to figure it out and allow people to go to games. Because you know, going to games helps the economy too. If you know there's a game, say a Wednesday night in Toronto, people, people go to work, go to the office, which they might go buy a sandwich. They might go 7-Eleven because otherwise people are working from home and you're not spending money. And maybe that's safer, but does it help the economy long? Again, I'm not a financial expert here. That's again, I, I do try to master in common sense and that does seem to make some sense to me, but. Anyway, um, everybody, hope you guys have a great Saturday, uh, the rest of your Saturday. Enjoy the sports uh, for the rest of the day and for the rest of the weekend. Be back Monday to talk to you all about the NFL and any other news that we get over the course of the weekend. But stay healthy, stay safe, and talk soon.